Well, welcome. I know you have many choices when choosing your professional development. There are many opportunities here at the University of Arizona Global Campus to have those options. So thank you for choosing us, Ed Talks, brought to you by the Department of Education and Liberal Arts here at the Global Campus. I'm Jackie Kiger, and I'm going to be your host for today, and I appreciate you being here with us. This will be our third presentation in our eighth series of education talks. Ed Talks are fashioned after TED Talks, that ever popular way of sharing concepts through personal storytelling. This year, it's all about multipliers. The awareness of its importance that author Liz Wiseman has made known in her New York Times bestseller, Multipliers, How the Best Leaders Make Everyone Smarter. Our focus today will be on the topic of the liberator. And here to help us explore and extend Wiseman's foundational concept of the liberator with her story is our own Dr. Adrian Hansen. As you listen to her story, you might listen for your call to action in sharing your uh, practices that support a culture of leadership and that multiplier effect within your classroom and interactions with students and colleagues, or perhaps you will find a new practice that her story sparks within you. Adrian, can you come on the camera and say hello as I introduce you to everybody? Adrian Hansen is a leader in all things liberal arts here at the Department of Education and Liberal Arts. Her and her team make up the second half of our department's name. Dr. Hansen's hold, hold, I'm sorry, Dr. Hansen holds a Bachelor of Arts in English from Bernard College, a Master of Science in Scottish Literature and Comparative Literature from the University of Edinburgh. And Adrian holds a Doctor of Philosophy in English from New York University. Prior to her role in leading our liberal arts department, she has served the university as chair of both the Applied Linguistics program and the English program. She leads by example, and she also teaches courses in information literacy, British literature, and English capstone. She is involved in university committees focused on faculty support, professional development, and scholarship, and on student retention and engagement. As a faculty editor for the University of Arizona Global Campus Humanities Review, a peer-reviewed journal of student essays in topics relevant to the humanities. She mentors students through the process of bringing original research to publication. Dr. Hansen lives in Colorado with her family and several spoiled cats. When not teaching, she enjoys reading fiction and writing fiction. She's an avid support and patron of the visual and performing arts in her community, as well as exploring the nearby mountains in which she lives. Adrian, thank you so much for being here with us today. Next slide, please. I'm now gonna ask that we remove our video so we can get started. As a reminder, Ed Talks are fashioned after TED Talks, the ever popular way of sharing personal stories for only 18 minutes of monologue. We do this because we wanna hear your story and we can best do that by sharing our stories. Our goal here is not necessarily to teach you anything new as you are already an expert in your field. Our goal is to perhaps motivate you to try something new in your approach to helping your students succeed. At the end of our Ed Talk today, we look forward to learning your story of what you are doing or will do in your approach as a liberator. Next slide, please. But for now, please hold your chat comments to the end, as I do not want you to miss a single word. And with that, Adrian, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Jackie. Are you a liberator? What does it mean to be a liberator? When I think of the word liberator, I think of some of our modern heroes men and women who risked and gave their lives and livelihoods to enable change, equality, and personal liberty. The allies of World War II, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., 
The great feminist icons of the 20th century who paved the way for generations of women to first vote, then strive for equality in the workplace. I think of the men and women of our armed forces, some of them our students, who keep peace in war-torn regions, bring assistance when natural disasters strike, and even liberate communities from tyranny and oppression. As an English professor, I can't help but think of some of the great liberators of fiction. The role of liberator is almost a prerequisite for the archetype of the epic hero. Odysseus, Homer's Greek hero of the Trojan War, helps to liberate Helen from her abductor Paris, and later his men from the Cyclops Polyphemus. Never mind that it's debatable whether Helen actually wanted to be rescued and returned to her husband, and that Odysseus attempted to get out of the whole thing by pretending to be insane. There is Aeneas, the mythical founder of the city of Rome, who in Virgil's epic tale gathers the small group of survivors of the Trojan War and finds a new home for them in Italy. Beowulf liberates the Danes from the monster Grendel, and later his own people from a fire-breathing dragon. In a more modern example, Frodo Baggins, the Hobbit and J.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings trilogy, is an unlikely liberator who must ultimately embrace the challenge to save Middle-earth from the evil Lord Sauron by throwing the ring into Mount Doom. And let's not forget Eowyn, the Lady of Rohan, who rides into battle alongside the Hobbit Mary and kills the Witch King in the Battle of Pelennor Fields. Some of the best examples of liberators in 21st century fiction come from the world of young adult novels. My personal favorite is Katniss Everdeen of Suzanne Collins's The Hunger Games trilogy. In her book, Multipliers, How the Best Leaders Make Everyone Smarter, Liz Wiseman situates the figure of the liberator within an organizational setting. She writes that multipliers liberate people from the oppressive forces within corporate hierarchy. They free people to think, to speak, and to act with reason. They create an environment where the best ideas surface and where people do their best work. The liberator is a multiplier who creates an environment where intelligence is engaged, grown, and transformed into concrete successes. Wiseman identifies the conditions for this kind of success. The environment where good things happen is one in which people generate ideas easily, learn rapidly, adapt well to new situations, work collaboratively, solve problems, and accomplish difficult tasks. But how does one become a liberator? Wiseman identifies three practices of the liberator which give us a starting point. A liberator creates space, demands people's best work, and generates rapid learning cycles. Let's turn these into questions that are relevant to our work at UAGC. Where do you create space for your students and colleagues to learn, think, and produce? How do you encourage those around you to do their best work? How do you facilitate rapid learning in yourself and others? After reading Wiseman's chapter, I tried to think of times in which I had been a liberator as a teacher, colleague, spouse, or mom. While I could think of a few instances, I thought I could understand the concept of the liberator better if I considered who in my life had been a liberator to me. One name came to mind, Suzanne. Suzanne is one of those people who, when asked who's had the greatest influence on my life, or who I admire most, or who was my childhood hero, her name comes instantly to mind. I met Suzanne when I was four years old. My dad had just retired from the Air Force at the end of the Vietnam War and enrolled in a graduate program. On Fridays, he would meet a friend at the old university tennis courts for some exercise. And afterwards, they would have coffee and donuts at a nearby shop. Every Friday morning, the same woman stood behind the counter. Late 40s, dressed more for a ladies' tea party than Dunkin' Donuts, in an elegant and expensive looking flowered skirt and matching sweater, hair carefully styled and set, Chanel red lipstick, and with a strong accent. 
One morning, my dad got up his nerve to ask her where she was from. She became somewhat defensive. She was French from Paris, and she hadn't always worked in a donut shop. She was a piano teacher. I'm not sure my dad actually believed her, but he asked, she, he asked if she would be willing to teach a four-year-old. My preschool teacher had told my parents that I should start music lessons. While the other kids sat quietly for story time, I would persist in singing and banging on toy instruments in one corner of the classroom. Suzanne replied that four was the perfect age. She had begun at age three. We lived out in the country back then in my grandparents' farmhouse. And the following week, Suzanne, the donut lady, rumbled up our dusty road in an oversized burgundy Cadillac, which she called Emily. To this day, I can still conjure up the smell of Emily's leather seats baking in the sun as the neighborhood kids climbed in and around the car. We had found a few other families along the road who wanted piano lessons for their children also. So she was more than happy to make the trip out for a new group of students and some additional income. We didn't have a piano, so Suzanne taught me to recognize the keyboard drawn on poster board on the kitchen table. After a few months, my dad scraped together enough to buy a small piano. As he likes to say, on credit, lots of credit. Suzanne thought I had promised, declared me a scholarship student, and settled on tuition far below the going rate. Who was this Suzanne? A donut lady who seemed to have fallen on hard times herself, giving a scholarship to a four-year-old? Who does that? Fast forward nine years. When I was 13 years old, Suzanne decided it was time to try something challenging, and she introduced me to Chopin's Fantasy Impromptu. If you aren't familiar with the piece, you may recognize the song, I'm Always Chasing Rainbows, which was used in several movies in the 1940s and sung famously by Judy Garland. That beautiful melody sits in the middle of the piece, situated between two fast passages in which the right hand plays four notes per beat and the left hand plays three notes per beat. The syncopated rhythm can be quite challenging to play, especially at a high rate of speed. But as I felt myself soar with the melody, I was in love. Piano lessons and piano practice were no longer something I did. A concert pianist is what I wanted to be. The teenage years were difficult at both school and home, and the piano and Suzanne's house became a refuge. She was an accomplished painter in addition to being a pianist, and in every room of her house, oil paintings of different shapes and sizes hung from floor to ceiling. Most of them still lifes of flowers she had grown in her large garden. Her style influenced by French masters like Monet, Pissarro, and Cezanne. Leafy plants and ferns nestled in corners and on windowsills. And of course, in the center of the living room, her nine foot Baldwin concert grand, which she kept gleaming with copious amounts of lemon oil. She decided I needed more than one lesson per week. And I found myself at her house two and three afternoons a week, often for hours at a time. My mother fretted about money. Once again, Suzanne declared me a scholarship student and only accepted a fee for one hour per week. When the teenage angst became too much, I declared to my parents that I was going to leave and go live at Suzanne's house. My mother's response was always, no, you aren't, you'll starve. She has nothing in that fridge but the flower she's painting. Wiseman identifies the first practice of the liberator, create space. Suzanne's home represented many different kinds of spaces for me. It was a physical space and an aesthetic space, one of beauty, art, nature, and harmony. It was an, an emotional space where I could distance myself from problems at home and school. It was also an intellectual space in which I had the freedom and encouragement to try out new compositions and new interpretations. Interestingly, Suzanne also enabled a financial space. I knew that my access to knowledge and experience would not be cut off due to my family's financial challenges. 
What kinds of spaces do our students need in order to flourish? And how can we create those spaces in the online environment? At the beginning of the 20th century, Virginia Woolf penned her famous essay, A Room of One's Own, in which she contemplated what was necessary for a woman of her generation to become a writer, an intellectual. She identified two necessities, a little money in the bank and a room of her own. My students love Woolf's essay because they identify with the need for physical, intellectual, and even financial space. Creating space, however, is only the first step. As Wiseman notes, liberators create space, but they demand the best work in return. When I was 15 years old, my town launched a music scholar exchange program with the city of Chester, England. Each year, Chester would send a young musician to my town to play a concert, and my town would send a young musician to Chester to play at the beginning of the Chester Music Festival. I was selected the second year of the program, an exciting proposition for a teenager who had never really gone anywhere and had only been on an airplane once. My parents had decided that I needed a new influence in my musical life, and they had sent me to study with a professor of piano at the music school of our large state university. Everyone said I should feel very lucky. Leonard was the best teacher in the state and his students consistently won the major competitions. But I didn't feel lucky. Wiseman identifies the opposite of the liberator, the tyrant. Now, it's probably unfair to label Leonard as a tyrant. He taught primarily graduate students, he demanded perfection, and he could only give one hour of his time. I was not a favorite, just another student a 15-year-old taking lessons from a no-nonsense, take-no-prisoners professor who probably had better things to do. Wiseman writes that while liberators create an intense environment that requires concentration, diligence, and energy, tyrants create a tense environment full of stress and anxiety. Tyrants dominate the space and suppress people's thinking and capability. Lessons with Leonard were certainly tense. While he demanded perfection, he didn't always articulate how to get there, and he often seemed distracted by other work lying around the studio. After three months of preparing for my England concert and struggling with the Schumann Sonata that he had chosen for my program, he declared that there was no way I would be ready and that I should withdraw from the contract. He would call the committee and see if his top undergraduate student could go. I was furious and convinced he just didn't want to help me. I found out later that he was planning a sabbatical and my concert was interfering with his plans. So back to Suzanne I went. I went to England and the concert was a success. It probably wasn't as perfect as it could have been under Leonard's coaching, but it was my best work at the time and more importantly, I had fun. The second practice of the liberator defined by Wiseman is demand the best work. Both Suzanne and Leonard demanded my best work, but they did it in different ways. Leonard hovered over me while I played, both physically and intellectually. He called out every small error, which made his students tense and jumpy and resulted in more mistakes. He would even ridicule a student in front of an entire classroom during his weekly master class. One week it was me who couldn't get a passage quite right. My attempts went from bad to worse while he railed and huffed and puffed across the small stage and the graduate students watched in awkward terror. Frustrated, I slammed down the piano lid and stormed out. Suzanne made space for mistakes and her focus was technique. If she could get a student to master technical skills, correct notes and musicality would come naturally. Suzanne once mentioned that she had worked as a teaching assistant of pianist and composer Nadia Boulanger at the Paris Conservatory in the late 1930s. Boulanger was known for mentoring composers such as Igor Stravinsky, Gabrielle Faure, Aaron Copland, Philip Glass, and Paul Hindemith. When a student brought Boulanger a new composition, she would dissect it line by line, circling two measures here and saying, that there is a Bach fugue. 
Then circling two measures further down, that sounds like a Chopin Polonaise. Then a few more measures further down. These measures are Brahms. She would then ask, can't you come up with something more interesting? Is this your best work? Finally, she would circle a line and say, aha, now that is you. Go and develop that idea. She is quoted as saying, you need an established language, and then within that established language, the liberty to be yourself. It is always necessary to be yourself. Wiseman writes that asking people if they are offering their best work gives them the opportunity to push themselves beyond previous limits. But she also emphasizes that someone's best work must be given voluntarily. When a liberator creates an environment where someone's full effort can be offered and is desperately needed, the person will freely give their best thinking and work. Leonard telling me I couldn't do something made me want to do it even more to prove him wrong. This happened again a year later when I told him that I wanted to learn my favorite piece, Chopin's E minor piano concerto. He said it was too hard for me. Again, I was suspicious that he just didn't want to help me or didn't trust my abilities. I made a deal with him. I would learn it in two months. If I couldn't learn it in two months, I would give it up and not mention it again. I learned it in two months. Then I quit his studio and returned to Suzanne's. The third practice of the liberator is generate rapid learning cycles. Wiseman defines this as a rapid cycle between thinking, learning, and making and recovering from mistakes in order to generate the best ideas. Within this learning cycle, the liberator creates an environment that is equal parts pressure and learning. Liberators expect mistakes, so do tyrants. But while the tyrant stands ready to pounce on those who make them, the liberator stands ready to learn as much as possible from the mistake. In music, there really isn't such thing as a perfect performance, and there is never only one way to play a piece of music. A performer may interpret a composer's score through a variety of lenses. For example, the time period or style in which the composer was writing, recordings of other great musicians, or the performer's own emotional state or experiences. Each performance is an exercise in thinking, learning, and trying something new. At UAGC, our undergraduate courses are a brisk and intensive five weeks. A rapid learning cycle is automatically assumed in each course. But how do we facilitate student thinking, learning, mistake making, and recovery within that framework? And how do we as instructors, course designers, and student support professionals learn from students' mistakes and our own mistakes? Suzanne was a master at facilitating rapid learning and rapid learning cycles, and I was privileged to be able to learn much of the classical piano repertoire in my nearly 15 years of study with her. But who was Suzanne? Suzanne, whose modest home in a Denver suburb was stuffed with displays of fine art, vases overfilled with exotic flowers, antique gilded furniture more suited for a museum, and a nine-foot concert grand piano. Who was this Suzanne, who proudly wore long mink coats to her students' concerts and dressed in brightly colored yet elegant clothing that seemed to come from another time? Who threw parties for musicians, artists, French expatriates, and bohemians, at which we would crowd around the piano and improvise late into the night? parties that made my mother nervous. I can still see Suzanne sitting at the piano, head thrown back in laughter, her fingers bright with red polish, sweeping the keys, creating astonishing sounds. Who offers a scholarship to a four-year-old when they are eking out a living in a donut shop? Who continues to offer a scholarship to a 13-year-old when they are still living student to student? People who are liberators do that. Who was this Suzanne? Over the years, I was able to piece together a story, a history. Suzanne grew up in one of the wealthiest families in Paris. Her father was a tenor with the Paris Opera, 
and Suzanne entered the Paris Conservatory at a young age. The composer Claude Debussy was a regular guest at the family's home, and Nadia Boulanger, the mentor of many famous 20th century composers, took Suzanne under her wing. As the Nazis invaded France and marched towards Paris in the summer of 1940, Suzanne was one of many concert pianists who fled, with the help of Boulanger and a young American from Wyoming. She immigrated to America, married the American, and started a new life on his ranch outside of Casper, Wyoming. A woman who was liberated from war-torn Europe, who overcame bad marriages, dislocations, and economic hardship, became herself a liberator. Wiseman notes that master teachers are by nature liberators, and she challenges us to think about the best teachers we have had. What type of learning environment did they create for you? How much space and freedom of thought did you have? What were the expectations for your performance? How were you stretched? How did you actually perform? Those master teachers, those liberators can offer real world examples of what it means to create space, demand the best work and facilitate rapid cycles of learning. Students offer their best and boldest when a teacher liberator requires their best work and creates the environment in which to do that work. But as I asked the question, who is Suzanne? I also began to wonder, who are our students? What don't we know about them? What stories do they bring to the classroom? And how can those stories intersect with the space we create our demand for the best work, and our facilitation of rapid learning. How can we tap into student stories and nurture the student-mentor relationship as liberators and not tyrants? I would like to conclude by revisiting our three questions prompted by Wiseman. Where do you create space for your students and colleagues to learn, think, and produce? How do you encourage those around you to do their best work? How do you facilitate rapid learning in yourself and others? What does a liberator professor do? Thanks for listening to my story. Jackie, back to you. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you very much for sharing your story. Um, your liberator. Suzanne. And I think I speak for everyone when I say how much we appreciate you sharing her oil paintings as we listened along. How lovely a visual for such a heartwarming story as you've taken us to a place in our approach to teaching, a place where the sign simply reads, are you a liberator? How wonderful it would be to think that my students, I can free them from that tyranny of APA format in that same fashion that Beowulf liberated the Dane from the monster Grendel, or that I too protect them from that fire-breathing dragon of plagiarism. Do my students, do they view me as Hunger Games Katniss, or even the Lord of the Rings Frodo. I don't know. But today, I think my work is done. If they could at all in any shape or fashion compare me to a humble coffee and donut host. Who through a kind word and an offered opportunity to share music, created a space for music with a high standard that demanded the best, which changed a life forever. Audience members, we invite you to consider and share, how do you create that space for your students? How do you help them deliver their very best work and how do you facilitate those rapid learning cycles? We'd also love 
to hear from you. So to share with us using your audio, simply raise your hand using the hand icon at the bottom of your screen. You will then be given the opportunity to unmute your microphone and share your story or your reflection. We invite you to join the conversation to inspire others with your story. Thank you, Patricia. I, it, it is so thought provoking. Um, I, I prepared my notes, but I, I almost went off of my notes because Adrian reminded us that to promote being yourself with our students. And when we promote our students to be their self, we, we, we welcome them that opportunity for them to be their very best self. And I just love that about this presentation today. And I love that about our ed talks. We, we give our presenters that same, that same lectern to be themselves. And I think we saw that in full force today. Hi, Jackie, it's Allie. Hey, Allie, how are you today? I'm good, how are you? Great. Um, I think what Adrian was sharing and the different experiences she had with her piano teacher slash life teacher, more like it, um, is it builds around the relationships. I think for us to have our students be able to be willing to go out on a limb and try something new and fail and, and be creative and go through that entire process, they have to know that it's okay. So I think a lot of that relates to how we start our courses initially and that very first work the students provide in, in making sure we're finding all the good we can out of it so that they're willing to try more and put in the effort. Um, obviously the second piano teacher at the, the best piano teacher in the state was good at what he did, but he had no relationship with Adrian. And then so she had no reason to work towards his accolades. And I think we need to be real mindful of our five or six week courses that just fly by that that very first week is almost a make or break time for us. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is. And then you create that space and, and thank you for, for reminding us of how that, how that does come together in our classrooms. I, I see Kathleen uh, Friedman, you have your hand raised. Yeah. And you know, I just wanted to piggyback on what Allie was saying. Um, I teach in the capstone courses for the Dell and I often think about the instructors that the students have had prior to me and did they make a connection with any of them? Do they have that person or that instructor that made a difference? And I guess what I'm trying to say is I like to be that instructor in the end for them. I like them to walk away from UAGC saying, wow, what a great experience I had having an instructor who cared about me and who wanted me to succeed like we all do. You know, another thing that I came away with from this presentation was um, my three boys. And I wonder who they would say were their liberators. And I hope that they have them in their lives. And it doesn't necessarily need to be me or um, their father, but it would be interesting to ask. So I thank you for putting that nugget in my brain, Adrian, and, and helping me look at my own children differently and making sure they have a liberator in their life. That, that is awesome. I, I didn't think of that, but you know, I was also wondering what our role is to find liberators for people who need them. You know, for example, our, our children, are there people that we can seek out that can, you know, give them education something we can't or do we have a student who really needs something and we we can't help but we know somebody else who can and um perhaps there are ways of of if we can't ourselves be the liberator find you know find one for for students or, or children or whoever needs them who has that expertise absolutely uh, kelly you have your hand raised we'd love to have you come on the mic Thank you, Adrian. Thank you so much for that um, amazing 
willingness to be vulnerable and to share your story. And I think you're sitting in front of a piano. So I hope that means that you're going to play something for us. But one of, one of the things that I was thinking about is this idea of how uh, we have to commit to getting to know our students. And that takes different kind of time. And it takes time away from the six week intense curriculum. And, um, and it also takes a willingness to share ourselves and things that are important in our lives and be willing to, um, you know, maybe meet with the student at an off time and jump on Zoom so that they can see that, you know, your dog interrupts and your kiddos are peeking through the window or whatever, because that makes you real as well. And, and I think it's challenging within six weeks to, to think about how to build those relationships. And yet, time after time, we hear the power of how we can be liberators, but it does take a commitment and investment of our time. So thank you for that. Thank, thank you, Kelly. Um, and, and yes, Adrian is sitting in front of her piano. And um, it, it's... In visiting and getting to know her even more through this Ed Talk series, um, it's a big part of her life um, that that now her children are going to be seeing the benefit of, and and not to be too intrusive, but the um, the paintings that we saw in the slide, she also has those some of those same paintings in her home by Suzanne. Is, is it are those the ones that are behind you now? These are these are different ones. These are unsigned, which I pulled out of the trash in her garage. <laughs> she she was moving and I walked in when I this was actually after I was no longer her student. I think I was in graduate school and I stopped by to say hi and she was moving and she had a stack of them in the garage. I said, what are you doing? She said, oh those are those aren't any good. The, the trash man has to take them and I said he can't take those and and uh, she didn't want to hear it so I my sister and I grabbed a bunch and she didn't care they again they are unsigned um but and they're my sisters were lost in a fire so they're the only two I have left and um they make me happy so uh, they're they're very typical of what she had in her house uh and but th these are a little bit different style the ones that you saw online were later in her life when she was a little bit more impressionistic um so, but you know, one thing that I, as I, when I, after I finished the talk and I pretty much had it set, I, there was, I was also thinking um, about how we, liberators impact us in other ways, not just related to a specific role or discipline. And I don't know if, if I hadn't have had her in my life, um, maybe I wouldn't have studied abroad. She's the one that kind of made me interested in, in going to Europe and doing a graduate program there. And um you know, maybe I, I wouldn't have gone on to grad school or done literature. There's a lot of things I may not have done in my life if I hadn't have seen that, yes, I can do that and, and that is possible. And um, she kind of opened up a world of, of arts to me that I don't think I would have had otherwise. And we've never met her and we've only heard her story now for about 18 minutes or so of her impact in your life. But I, I think that we're feeling inspired to say, what, what do we do now? Just seeing the, the impact that she had on, on your life and, and the, the things and differences that, that we can do with, with our students. And i like to remind everybody, if, if you wanna come on microphone to use that virtual raise your hand so that I'll know uh, you're willing. And I also wanna point out a couple of things in the chat. Um, Denise mentions being a liberator in the classroom requires being willing to be there, not just with a physical presence, but emotionally to connect with them, being willing to admit our struggles, errors, and the journey to be supportive of others. The, the whole person, I, I think we can agree, is required of, of good teaching because in good teaching, there's, there's good connecting. And I think we see that opportunity every day. And, and I feel maybe the purpose of, of this talk is to be a little more mindful of that to say, okay, am I responding to it when I see those opportunities?
I'm just scrolling through here. I see uh, where Ray has made a few posts and I was trying to find that one he made, here it is. Um, the, he, he makes a mention about teaching uh, back in 2008, the philosophies of punishment in an associate corrections course and, and how that realization of the impact of the, the entire criminal justice systems and, and parents and, and societies. And, um, you know, we, we, we never know anyone's story. Sometimes it's baggage and sometimes it's assets, but we just don't know. And so, you know, my, my takeaway from all of this and, and Adrian did, did a wonderful job of, of reminding us just as we weren't sure who Suzanne was, it became clear she was special. And then to hear her story, and then to Denise's point about finding that time to connect with students and learn their story too along the way. And then they in turn learn yours. And I, I think I think that's just being a good neighbor that happens to be a good teacher. And along those same lines, Jackie, I, I have a lot of students who seem to be quite fearful. Um, they're, they're nervous about going back to school. They're nervous about a particular class. Um, but one of the main things that they, they're nervous about is, is um, fitting the, the, the work into their lives. You know, they have children, they have elder care, they have jobs. And, and when a student comes to me and says, I, I'm really, really sorry, I, I can't get that discussion posted by tonight, I can do it tomorrow. And you can just, you can feel the, hear the, the desperation there. Um, and so I, I think it, it's so important to not be a tyrant <laughs> and to, 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 you know, be a liberator in, in giving them the space to do that. But I think in, in through this, the, the, the concept that I found most interesting was the one of space and um, different what space means. It means a variety of different things and how we can, we can create that. And um, I, I think we do pretty well with demanding best work and, and with learning cycles. But I, I, I think in the online classroom, the space issue is one that I, I think is worth thinking more about. And, and that's the one that resonated the most with me. Absolutely. And you know, it's amazing that space, that online space, um, it used to be kind of an option to an education. And we saw in this last year where um, out of necessity, a, a lot of K through 12, especially, um, ended up moving over to an online space. Um, I have a lot of friends who are K through 12 educators in the community that I live, and it uh, was not a good experience for them because you can't simply move over. You, you have to prepare, you have to take that space and, and create those uh, uh, learning environments, certainly as we do in our approach to the curriculum we teach, but then also in, in how we um, introduce and train faculty to uh, being responsive to that through professional development such as this. So I, I appreciate everyone's willingness to be here today to continue uh, sharpening your saw and putting yourself in a position to, to say, what, what can I do differently through the lens of a liberator? I don't see any more hands raised and I, I see the chat is slowing down here. So um, while our time is uh, winding down, um, I would like to uh, remind everybody that um, please watch the chat box uh, for uh, your screen. You're gonna get a link to the EdTalk homepage where this uh, recorded EdTalk will be archived for future viewing uh, along with certificates of participation. You'll also find the link to the EdTalk homepage in today's invitation. Next slide, please. We again want to acknowledge the work of Liz Wiseman in her multiplier book for the inspiration for today's EdTalk, as well as the rest of our series this year. We would like for you to mark your calendars and be watching for the June invitation for our next EdTalk session, where on June the 17th, uh, Dr. Jesse Upshaw will be your host and Dr. Tamika Fitzpatrick will be sharing on the topic of the challenger 
as we continue the conversation of multipliers. We thank you for joining us today. A huge thank you again to Dr. Adrian Hansen for sharing with us and to inspire our next steps in supporting our students and each other. So on behalf of the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Tony Farrell, and your friends here at the Department of Education and Liberal Arts at the University of Arizona Global Campus, we thank you for being here. We'll see you next month. Bye, everybody.